Welcome to The Gray Report. I'm your host, Spencer Gray. And if you're a multifamily investor, really any kind of real estate investor, you're tracking the market, well, The Gray Report is the best YouTube show and podcast that's really dedicated to helping you make the most informed and the best investment decisions related to real estate. We're covering all the latest research reports, all the data that's coming in, covering the multifamily industry, commercial real estate, just real estate in general, as well as a lot of these, you know, the macroeconomic forces that are really kind of pushing the market one way or the other. Um, so, you know, a lot of Fed watch and everything else that goes into kind of driving these markets. We got Matt Boss Nagel, Director of Communications and Marketing here at Great Capital to kind of walk us through all these reports. A lot of really good stuff today. Again, just giving a little bit more information. Reports from Newmark, Cushman and Wakefield, Zumper, Bercadia, and NAR. Matt, let's get into it. All right, welcome back to The Gray Report. Um, Matt, a lot of good stuff on the report. Um, first off, though, congrats. Congratulations. Um, we had a big close this week. Hey, here congratulations to you. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, a lot, a lot of hard work, um, I think, paid off. Um, yeah. You know, congratulations to all your investors and partners. Um, we closed on 122 unit um, B class multifamily property um, in Indianapolis, Indiana. You know, our, our home market, um, smooth transaction. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in today's market, you know, nothing's necessarily smooth with all the uncertainty. Very um, true. So to be able to get through it, um, it's going to be a great pickup for the fund. So yeah. we're, you know, really excited, but, uh, yeah, it's a know. solid property. I'm really, I, I'm excited for, you know, I learned so much every, every time we have a property, I learned so much about them, kind of the market around it and the yeah. different conditions. And there's so many things to be optimistic about that area that, yeah. we, that we bought into. Yeah. So. We, yeah. We really dug into that, that market. I mean, we already yeah. knew it, but you know, you can have a, some of the data, but then once you really, you know, start doing your due diligence, you yeah. really pick apart the pieces. It, it's Look. exciting to see. You know, a lot of your, you know, assumptions, you know, being confirmed one way or the other. You yeah. know, sometimes they're not, but, you know, just see like, you know, this is a really incredible opportunity, the property, but then that, yeah, that surrounding yeah. just immediate submarket all the jobs that are going in there. Yeah, really, yeah. Just the really growth sad. of the industrial market in, in yeah. Indianapolis is incredible. Yeah. Um, but that's so, not, I guess we're multifamily more. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but it's, 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 you know, they're, they're, it's a driver, you know, yeah. uh, of the growth because, yeah. you know, those new jobs are, which there's you know, thousands of open positions right now, just with very little like housing supply that's yeah. coming online. Um, and then they're paying pretty decent wages that kind of line up right with kind of what our you know, target rents are. For sure. Um, so if you'd like to learn more, you know, hop on over to great.fund. It's only open to accredited investors, um, but definitely check it out. Um, if you'd like to participate, just learn more, talk about it. Um, but, you know, also give this video a like, subscribe to the channel, um, and make sure you're following to stay up to date every single week. You know, these videos come out on a weekly basis. Um, but you can also you know, sign up for the newsletter, hop on over to greatcapitalllc.com slash newsletter. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, and again, that, that like and that subscription that helps circulate this content to more individuals, more investors that are trying to learn more. So you're, you're helping some folks out. But um, that means, Matt, let's just get into some of these reports. The first one's from sure. Newmark, the Multifamily Capital Markets Q1 2022 report. Mm -hmm. um, it's got a lot of good information. Yeah. Um, you know, again, some of the problems with some of these reports in a fast moving market is that the information can be a little bit out of date. You know, we're looking yeah. at the last quarter and things are moving. I mean, the last six weeks have yeah. been yeah. so different. Um, but still, it's good information. What are some of the highlights? What are some of your takeaways? So, um, it, it, much like the um, the previous report that Newmark had over the capital markets for CRE as a whole, yeah. it has some great breadth and depth in here. And there's actually some additional pieces of information that they have about the multifamily market that they did not include in their kind of general capital yeah. markets report a couple weeks ago. Um, there, so with with that in mind, um, I, I'm kind of primed to notice. Uh, because we've seen so many Q1 reports and we've seen so many multifamily reports come across, I'm always I'm always watching out for the things that are different. Yeah. Um, and the things that are new or just these things that not a lot of people notice or not a lot of people are, I don't want to say willing to 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 say, but things that are perhaps de-emphasized. Yeah, it maybe bucks the conventional narrative a little bit because yeah. it can be a little bit of an echo chamber sometimes and especially. And, and, yeah. and, we, and you noted this before. I think that audience and sources are 
are really important to kind of think about when you're reading these reports. Like, what kind of business does Newmark have, and what was what will there be their incentive? Um, the same thing for Cushman and Wakefield, or Marcus and Millichap, or Bercadia. Like, where are they coming from? And that has a direct correlation, I think, to the kind of information that they're going to present. Either the information that they have, or yeah. the information that they're inclined to present. I think all of them are beholden to accuracy. They want they yeah. want to present. They want to have their, a reputation. They're not going to lie. Um, yeah. But that but it does mean that certain pieces of information are communicated more clearly than others. Yeah. Um, so with that in mind, uh, a paragraph in Newmark's report really stood out to me, and it said, um, while appreciation has been the primary driver of total returns recently, investors may shift their attention to markets with higher income returns should growth slow. A reversion to the mean is also possible with appreciation returns accounting for 19.8% over the trailing 12 months, well above the 10-year annualized average of 4.6%. This is kind of a tough fact, but I don't think it's entirely unexpected. I think it makes sense. Yeah. Even in January, the projections for the multifamily market had growth at a lower level than 2021. So it's not like things have really materially changed when you're thinking of that statement. Um, I also think them singling out appreciation as a particularly vulnerable to kind of a reversion of the mean is interesting. Um, I might be reading too much into their statement here, but appreciation returns going down could be due to the fact that renovations are more expensive. Um, And so you can't kind of force appreciation and it also could be due to a market that's had increasing competition for an extended period of time and and now we've got a market that's highly competitive but there's not that steady stream of new competition maybe entering the yeah. market that's out there to bid prices up higher and higher you know i think a lot of it comes down to kind of what your basis um was yeah. and you know some of the markets that have just incredibly low cap cap rates mm-hmm. you know the cap rates that were you know you know, sub, you know, sub four, kind of in the yeah. mid threes. Um, and, and it's a lot of the markets with high growth rates, um, you know, whether it's Phoenix or some of the markets in Florida yeah. or, or, or Texas. Um, so, but it's also, it's a factor of the low, the cheap debt that we saw um, mm-hmm, last mm-hmm. year that just doesn't exist today. And so yeah. you're going to have a lot of cases, people are already borrowing with negative leverage, meaning your cap rates higher than the interest rate that you're paying. Mm-hmm. Um, and your yield on cost is, is higher than the, the interest rate. And that's the impression that I've been getting over these past few weeks as as the market kind of reacts and as we as, as so many reports kind of consider the effects of, uh, of these interest rate hikes is there are certain property types, there are certain markets that are sensitive to these changes. Yeah. And uh, it could be that the ones that have been such high flyers, they get a little bit more sensitive to these changes, whether it's yeah. on the up or on the downside. What I, what I think is going to happen is I, we're already seeing cap rates tick up because mm-hmm. just people can't, again, they can't buy at a two cap or a three cap when they're paying um, you know, mid threes to five plus percent um, yeah. on the debt. Um, and so, but we're still seeing an incredible amount of top line growth um, driven by the organic rent growth, the difference between in place rents and market rents. And so we're going to see continued net operating um, income growth over the next couple of years. It's just what it, is that growth going to relate to the expansion of cap rates? And so I think it's really that rate of growth, which is, and this is true kind of across the economy, other asset classes, but it's that rate of growth for asset prices is going to kind of slow down yeah. to more normal levels. I mean, it was crazy the last two years. And so, but I don't think we're going to see price declines. I think we're going to see just that growth decline, maybe even flat, yeah. be flat for a little bit. And I think that's going to lead to some, you know, that we touched this earlier, but it's going to be lead to, you know, more uncertainty, mm-hmm. decreased sales volumes. Um, but I think it leads to some opportunities because you can buy at slightly higher cap rates. There's yeah. still some attractive financing out there. Um, but it's also going to be a shift to, and I think this is what you were hitting at and the report's hitting mm-hmm. at, to markets that are going to be a little bit more insulated, more focused yeah. on cash flow. And um, I guess this is the same disclaimer that we disclaimer that we gave to you know the influence of you know who's writing these reports. So you know we're biased in this case, yeah. but it, it's really empirically it's re- the return profile of some other markets that are growing but are more focused on cash flow, um, you know free cash flow and income um, com- versus appreciation, like markets in the Midwest, mm-hmm. um, some you know secondary and tertiary markets in the Southeast, not the big major markets. Uh, maybe like your Atlantas and, um, you know, in the Southwest and Phoenix. Mm-hmm. But there are some markets that have good growth that just the cap rates never got so crazy low that you can still find cash flow. And we've seen it. This happen over the last couple of months, even really kind of before some of these interest rates started rising. Because I was speaking to a lot of investors 
who were saying, you know, we're just, we, we're invested in the Sun Belt. We're in, invested in Florida. We're invested in Texas. We're looking for a slightly different return profile, something that produces more cash flow that's a little bit more stable. They're looking for some like ballast to their portfolio. Hmm. And now that these, again, low cap rate markets are looking pretty high risk because there's also a lot of supply coming into those markets. And so they are flowing into the Midwest, you know, markets like Indianapolis, like Cincinnati, like Kansas City, um, yeah. like, you know, Columbus, Ohio, mm-hmm. you know, Lansing, Michigan, Grand Rapids, Michigan, you know, markets like that. Um, for their return profile and their stability, you know, looking back at past recessions, past performance, yeah. and the fact that they're just, they're not being threatened by oversupply, but they're, they're they've been mispriced because mm-hmm. a lot of these markets have good growth, but just they're just not getting the capital inflows, or they didn't receive the capital inflows that you know the crowd was pushing into the Sun Belt. Yeah, I was looking last night as I was preparing um, all of these all of these articles and looking at kind of the 2019 prices. Yeah. Of uh, and and a little bit of a snapshot of where things were going immediately before the pandemic and during the pandemic and you see certain markets the trajectory kind of goes down during the pandemic and is starting to bounce up um and but other ones were just as popular before the right before oh, the yeah, pandemic for sure. as they are right now so yeah. there are long-term trends and short-term trends but some of them actually were have a separate pandemic story mm-hmm. that are just now remember, starting remember to remember any, any of those markets i mean maybe the more like destination markets i mean like, like boise like i'm thinking like a boise idaho yeah was already seeing growth but really accelerating a lot of those mountain west markets yeah. people leaving kind of you know the seattles and phoenix and Bay las Area. vegas were are, yeah. were just doing yeah. great even before yeah. and yeah. and now you know just looking at 2019 when there the scale was at six yeah. percent was like the top line and now it's it's a lot higher yeah the the metrics are are um especially on rent growth you know mm-hmm. they're, they're, they've broken the, the the dials and gauges yeah. um but so it's how but how much are you going to speculate on that but that's not going to go on forever we're seeing mm-hmm. this decline in growth we're still seeing growth we're seeing a decline in growth and so that's where some people could get in troubles if you're assuming you know 10 percent rent growth for the next five yeah. years like yeah. that's just not that's not plausible just because you're going to get some demand destruction at some point you can't just keep rising rents you know forever yeah. even with in low, low supply and market. and i think that that's that's another thing that i've been here you know and i've I mentioned this before is is this kind of price as a cure for high prices and there yeah. may you know may, there may be those kind of limits there and, and i think we've hit that on some on some price growth because it, yeah that made sense when you could borrow at you know two percent you know the mid two percent range mm-hmm. But now um, that's that's not an option anymore. Now you're having to buy at mid threes to kind of mid fours. Um, so you just you can't you know you can't get the leverage. You can't get the debt, which is I think a sign of a healthy market. Yeah. You know lenders are saying they're pulling back as mm-hmm. well. Um, but that limits what people can pay. Now there will be some people who take on a lot of risk and find ways to lever up. Um, but you know risk is going to equal return um, yeah. in that environment. And there's already enough growth. You don't really need to do that to get a, I think a much better risk and return. Uh, yeah, profile in, in, in balance. Um, this the the total returns relative to inflation. I think is interesting um, chart math. Yeah, um, you know, it, based what the graph says is despite brief time periods where inflation outpaced total returns over the long term, multifamily has outperformed inflation by six point eight percent annually on average, even with recent historically historically high levels of inflation over the trailing twelve months. Multifamily total returns averaged twenty four point one percent exceeding inflation by 15 1560 basis points um so you know what 15.6 percent um so i mean we we've talked about this in the last show is that you know there's as much uncertainty that as there is right now in the markets we've been investing in multifamily um is it stable but we've always known that this type of event as kind of as hard it is as it is for so many people yeah. is one of the reasons why we said in that event multifamily is going to outperform and yeah. that's what we're seeing um and that's given us the, the confidence to continue to make acquisitions at the right prices and getting the right basis yeah it's part of the fundamental benefits of multifamily it, investment exactly. is that it's a guard against inflation and it's relatively insulated from market volatility exactly but I, what's critical is you have to have like a long-term perspective yeah you know if you're focused um, as every investor should be, especially every you know syndicator, you know the preservation of capital should be you know the first you know first and second rule. Um, you achieve that by having you know a duration that will allow to you know weather certain economic events because mm-hmm. we know the ten year outlook. 
very yeah. confident in the five-year out- outlook, even confident in the three. But knowing that we've got 10 years, we know that we're going to have a successful um, investment yeah. if we give ourselves that time. That doesn't mean we have to hold for 10 years, but if we can, we're setting ourselves up for success as mm-hmm. opposed to kind of rolling the dice and taking on a lot of risk. Yeah. Um, so I, I would say that just in general, to the point of you know this graph, having a long-term mindset is a great practice in risk um, mitigation. Mm -hmm. I I would say. Um, So, you know, income returns, this is kind of coming back to kind of the cash flow versus appreciation discussion we were having, Um, you know, income returns as a percentage of total returns. And so they're saying, according to NAR, this is them um, writing, while appreciation has been their primary driver of total returns recently, investors may shift their attention to markets with higher income returns should growth slow. A revision to the mean is also possible with appreciation returns accounting for 19.8% over the trailing 12 months, well above the 10-year annualized average of 4.6. So, Matt, I think you read that, that earlier, but I think it's just, again, it highlights that we've had so much so much of the return has just been from cap rate compression, yeah. which hasn't necessarily been the norm historically. And I think we were kind of reverting to more historic um, times in kind of economics at some point where there is going to be a more value on free cash flow rather than just growth. Yeah. And again, I think looking at some of those markets – Many of them in the Midwest is a kind of a opportune strategy for the market we're in right now. Yeah, um, I I I was particularly drawn to the the section about dry powder. Um, that's something that we've we've talked about before um, last year and and even you know at the beginning of this year. Um, it talks it says that dry powder has increased slightly um, a, a smidge from last year. It was. Two hundred forty-nine point two billion in twenty twenty-one, and and two hundred fifty billion in twenty twenty-two. Um, the the metaphor of dry powder, it's it's like keep your powder dry and be ready for action mm-hmm. at a moment's yeah. notice. Um, cash that's poised to strike once the opportunity is right. Um, so they also have a breakdown here of what these uh, the targets of these uh, multifamily or residential um, dry powder are are poised to strike at. Yeah. Um, and the top. At 52.9% is opportunistic, and then value add at 35.1%, and then slivers for core, core plus debt. It's like they're waiting for the right opportunity. <laughs> I want to know how much dry powder is used in a, in a given year. Um, I'm assuming that not that, to have just you know been capitalist committed and it's floating out there. How much actually gets um, yeah deployed? So, and then because this, this is only talking about you know like committed capital in like funds that are reporting how much capital. It doesn't include like okay. what you typically see like you know syndicators raising capital. Yeah, this doesn't this isn't that doesn't include that but now this is probably the vast majority probably you know 90 mm-hmm. percent of the capital that's flowing in um but yeah, i'm i'm assuming then that a whole lot of that 249.2 billion actually was invested in projects but there were enough investors to bring that number back up again to 250 billion by the beginning of this year when you're, when we're talking about dry powder yeah uh, again I'm, I'm very curious about at the at the risk of stretching the metaphor too thin the dryness of this powder how much of that 249 was deployed last yeah. year and how much is just sitting there sitting there because this uh, using the word opportunistic it's like you're waiting for that perfect property to come by you know the one with like 10 percent cap rate yeah. or something and well you know i mean and we it's do, just not gonna come i mean we, we can look a little bit at the sales volumes right and, and let me just pull pull that um chart up here um you know we did have record sales vol sales volumes in 2021 last year i mean it, it broke the records i mean in 2019 we're at you know what this is about 100 um and what 80 you know mm-hmm. b- billion dollars or or so and in 2020, we went down to, you know, just, uh, you know, like 150 or so. And in 2021, it crushed it. And we were kind of closer to like three, four, you know, 340, yeah. um, $340 billion. So, I mean, now, obviously, that's like total sales volume. That's not that's not equity. But if you break that down, I mean, typically, let's say it's, you know, 50 percent loan to value, mm-hmm. you know, on that $249 billion, yeah. you know, that should have bought them about, um, you know, 500 you know half a billion 500 billion dollars yeah. worth of assets so there's no way that it was unless the vast majority is you know very low leverage under 50 percent ltv which i don't believe is the case mm-hmm. you know they definitely did not get all of that out so how so i think you, you're posing a really good question of you know what's the carryover from last year how much yeah. didn't get allocated um and if a lot didn't get allocated that doesn't mean that like you know they're you know what are the actual inflows not just like what the total amount is like how many more people are coming in the multifamily mm-hmm. 
Yeah. I think those are all good questions. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, I think this dry powder is going to provide some kind of floor to prices yeah. because I think that there's so much is allocated and they need to get this allocated. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, h- how much are firms going to be incentivized to make that allocation versus yeah. waiting for that real opportunity, that true buying moment. Mm-hmm. Because remember back early in the pandemic, a lot of groups were saying, you know, they're, we're going to wait for like, we're going to wait for our COVID pricing. We're going to yep. wait for this big price drop. So everyone kind of stopped being in the market for a little bit of time, not doing deals, just waiting. And then all of a sudden prices didn't decline. They started going up. Yeah. You can star- <laughs> you can starve waiting for the best fish to come along. Or you could just catch a bunch of really good fish. <laughs> yeah. It's well, they, they say you know time, time in the market instead of timing the market, and you know don't wait to buy, don't wait to invest in real estate, buy real estate and wait. Yeah. Uh, so so that that's just the the skepticism that I had, and and I the, dry powder is even it's you know in and of itself it's a slang term, and and it, so it's not necessarily technically defined, but um, I I am interested in how long a given dollar waits as dry powder before it's deployed what the average length is and, yeah, that's and a good question. i bet there i bet there's numbers out there but that's just the the question yeah. that it raised with me so one more thing from this report and it's been a great report i know we're spending a lot of time on it but there's a lot of good aspects that it looks into that i think are pretty timely um now this is looking at just increasing cost of debt and really comparing um looking at the yield curve and looking at kind of the short-term debt versus like you know the long term you know we're looking at how much these rates have increased you know along the maturity curve um and obviously and this is again why it's this is very impactful um is because there's so much of these transactions so many of these deals especially in 2021 um we're facilitated with using shorter term bridge debt or debt fund um Mm -hmm. financing um because you know you had some more flexibility and you wanted to have a shorter duration because we were saying look there's so much rent growth we're going to see so much organic appreciation maybe we're going to force some appreciation we're going to refinance in two years maybe we can fund some of our rehab through a line of credit you know it was a great strategy and allowed you since the sh- those bridge loans are um, pegged to um, the shortest you know typically shorter term financing rate you know typically you know, like that 30 day sofa rate mm-hmm. um, it was a very very cheap cost of capital um, compared to some of the fixed rate products, which were just you know the ten year was quite, you know was low, but the ten year started rising um, before the shorter term, and it hasn't risen you know, nearly as much. So there's been less impact. So people investors have had to switch their strategy. All of a sudden, these shorter term bridge loans aren't as attractive as they used to be. And looking at just the price increases, or the increase in yield um, across the the curve, the these one the one year rates. I mean they've they've gone up by three hundred. And eighteen percent, um, you know. Whereas, kind of the immediate term, including the five year up to the ten year, I mean, the ten years come up fifty three percent, which is a huge move. But it's nothing like the three hundred eighteen percent at the one year. Now, further out in the curve, in the thirty year, you know, it's increased twenty eight percent. So rates have increased in general, um, but you know, those shorter term rates again, which facilitated people being able to bid up because they could get higher leverage a lot with these mm-hmm. bridge loans. That you know that music has stopped on on that strategy you know yeah. for now. Um, and you see like the the three hundred eighteen and the you know the two hundred twelve and even the fifty three percent increase. But you have to kind of think about base rates and and it's not like it's that it, it's not like everything's going up by fifty three percent. We're yeah. talking about a small percentage that was already abnormally low increasing by you know by a little bit more. Yeah. And now, just to kind of put a nice book in on this, and the the yield spread between um, you know the ten year Treasury and multifamily cap rates, um, and you know this isn't again this isn't it's a good metric, it's a good kind of comparison to make. It's not perfect though, because again, you know four and a half percent cap rate, yeah, that's average cap rate, but some folks are buying um, lower than that. And then you know the ten year yield, I mean that's a good relative term, but I, you know again what we've been talking about is not just what your your base index rate is, but what is your actual mortgage rate? Um, what's that you know that mortgage the actual interest you're paying or your mortgage constant? And because that now is in many cases well above four and a half percent, and especially if you're in some of those high flying markets, it, it's it could it could be close to the actual ten year treasury, and so you have that mm-hmm. inverted you know not only treasury spread to cap rate, but certainly mortgage rate to cap rate in some of those high flying markets, and that is what is 
going to force, I mean, has already started to force you know, some reduction in the um, growth of asset prices. Yeah. Um, and as more data comes out, we'll get more clarity um, on this because the spread is going to tighten even more. Um, and again, it would be more illustrative to not just have the 10 year treasury, but to have, you know, the so far as well, because then you exactly. can really see the yeah. difference as well. And then some, you know, a range of actual spreads that people are actually paying on the on those mortgages. Yeah. So, um, well, let Matt. Oh, know, I again, wanted to cover yeah, one the more rent over the year over year rent growth distribution. It's a little bit lower down there. Yeah. There it is here. Um, so they have them kind of separated into groups of of zero, zero to 5%, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to 20, and so on. And there, is, there are you know specific markets that are within that group. The largest amount of markets um, have year-over-year -year rent growth from 10 to 14.9, to let's say 15%. Um, so that's the by far the largest group of everyone. Um, what's What I thought was interesting was within that largest group, you kind of see some stories about where markets were moving during if you're thinking about where markets were moving during the pandemic how they're moving now there's some interesting trajectories especially for some of the larger and more expensive cities um i want to call attention to chicago san francisco and and i'll really lump in san jose as well um those were those were markets those three specifically weren't doing too well at the beginning of the pandemic and during the pandemic and now they're starting to catch up again i i it would be interesting to see uh, how if if their rent growth increases a little bit more, but um, for San Francisco and San Jose specifically, these are also places that are already had rents that were pretty expensive, and and the story during the pandemic was well, people don't want to pay those expensive prices when there's other places to go, um, and and it was a kind yeah. of reaction to the already high prices. Well, and, but there's also some base effect with San Francisco's numbers also because they actually saw yeah. some pretty stark declines, like you know fifteen percent declines, and mm -hmm. so there. Are, 12% year over year, but year, last year they were down 15%. Yeah. So I'm curious, not necessarily year over year, but 2019 to now. You know, what's interesting is San Francisco, and, you know, this is one of those cases where if you really had the foresight and could pay for the, and, and, and could pay up early at, a, at an earlier moment, it's one of the markets with the highest amount of, of value in income. Um, you know, th we had that chart there that's had yep. appreciation and in income. Well, San Francisco was at the uh, at the side of the chart where a lot of that value was in income, and it may just increase because we're because its trajectory has changed. Yeah. Um, and I think the same for Chicago is you know it was it wasn't doing too well, and there wasn't and, and it didn't even have that story of of San Francisco. It was just like hit really hard by the pandemic. And, and I think we're seeing that in a lot of like the major metros, mm -hmm. like the New York City, the San Francisco's, the Chicago's, is that as people are kind of returning to the office um, and maybe construction activity slowed down a little bit, um, you know, we're seeing those made really strong rent, really yeah. strong rent growth, which was really absent for most of the pandemic, whereas a lot of the secondary and tertiary markets were just, you know, steaming along ahead. Yeah. Again, the difference is there's all those bigger markets saw rent declines, whereas a lot of kind of secondary markets saw just flat rent growth or actually some rent increases during those times. So I think over the long term, still seeing that performance with the secondary and tertiary markets, but those primary markets are definitely yeah. starting to pick so up. So this is just one of those interesting things where, oh, things things do change. It's not it's not just the same trends that happen though all you know, throughout time. There are times when things it's that one can constant in life, right? Yeah. You know, that we're gonna see some change. All That's right, right, well let's just pivot, Matt, um, over to Cushion Wakefield mm -hmm. if if we're ready to go. Again, that was a great report. Um, if you'd like these reports I sent to you so you can actually um, go through them. One, you know, we will have them in the show notes, but also if you sign up for the newsletter, graycapitalllc.com slash newsletter, you'll get these reports and a lot more sent to you every week. You can also just go over to graybreport.com. That's up, updated daily. Um, so if, again, if you are interested in getting this data on a daily basis, you know, go check that out. Um, okay, so Cushman and Wakefield, where do property values go from here, Matt? That's what yeah, we're saying. so we're where, talking about appreciation asking. just now, and um, and this one really puts it in the research spotlight, as they call it. Um, solid work. I, I wish that I could read part two, because this is just part one that examines property values in different economic scenarios. This one looks at the impact of interest rates and inflation. Um, and again, it, it, it shows that it's doing pretty well in... Um, in high inflation environments, even really in environments that uh, kind of recession environments, and you're and if you look at the different properties, it, it talks about ap apartments, office, industrial, and retail. Um, apartments do better, it seems like, during in recession environments than any other property type. So, so if I my understanding the support correctly, um, in quarters that do not that 
all quarters, including recessions, between 1978 to present, 88% um, of those quarters returns exceeded inflation. Now, if you exclude recessions, it's 92% of all quarters. Yeah. Um, so if we see continue to see recession, uh, or sorry, if we continue to see growth without um, without a recession, you know, we should see we continue should, should continue to outpace, you know, nine times out of ten. Yeah. Um, that's basically what it's saying. That, that's a pretty good that's a pretty good track record. Pretty yeah. Good odds. And and just below that, there's the change in CRE sales volume under different inflation regi- regimes, where um, where how much did. Uh, how much were these inflation? How, did, how much did they affect sales? Um, and it says for all periods, inflation accelerating. It seems like sales increased by four point nine, four point five percent, and inflation decelerating, it increased by three point two percent. That's for all periods. Now, I I'm uh, I'm a little bit confused about because there's. There are three groups here. So it's all periods, excluding recessions, and then they do all periods with, with they, they don't just parse out oh, accelerating okay, okay, decelerating, it. so they have all periods, low inflation, sales increase 3.4%, mm-hmm. then they're saying in a high inflation, if we're in a high inflation environment, which is kind of like we're in now, sales volumes actually increase by 10%. Now, if we're in a sweet spot is what they call it, which is, you know, it's not, not too high, not too low, kind of Goldilocks. It's a twelve point two percent. So the sweet spot by you know, all everyone wants a sweet spot. That's the soft landing everybody wants. Yeah. We got just the right amount of you know growth, um, but it's not kind of getting over our skis. And everyone loves this. Technically, define it sense. here as inflation between one point five and two point five percent. Got it. So got some growth, but yeah, it's not not too high. Yeah, I thought so. That is interesting. Then, if inflation is increase or or high or increasing, if that's act, they're actually more likely to have people yeah. come into this well, to the commercial real estate. And, and market. again, this is coming back to what we've said you know a bunch of times is really you know the concern for multifamily is not inflation. Um, or real estate in general is not inflation. It it would be deflation, the opposite of yeah. what we're seeing right now. Now, inflation can make people nervous for the economy in general and that's seeping in but that's where i think yeah. the opportunity is and and that's something that that we've heard too a little bit from investors like well i don't know inflation but that's like just as much it's a reason for investors in general to be a little bit leery of investing in general yeah but just it's general. also a reason to choose if you're going to choose on investment it's better to choose cre than any yeah other i think having i think right now um again this isn't financial advice but i think having some cash ready to, to pounce on an opportunity mm-hmm. um if you Again, we can't really time anything, but and I don't think we've seen capitulation in the public markets, but I think there's going to be some great buying opportunities kind of in a lot of different asset classes. Yeah. So I think being ready for some of those opportunities when you actually see actual movement and stability, but I think being in some assets that are going to outpace inflation like apartments, uh, maybe some commodities or and then you know maybe some public equities that are just at a deep, deep discount yeah. right now. I think, I, I don't know, to me that makes a lot of sense, yeah. um, but... Again, I don't think, at least in the public markets, doesn't seem like we're at a full bottom, full capitulation just yet. I, it seems like, again, not a, not an expert in public markets, but there's got to be there's got to be a little bit more pain. And there's we're starting to see some pain, but we got to see like somebody really hurt, somebody kind of go belly up, being over leverage, somebody, yeah. and then the Fed decides, okay, maybe we're going to slow down. Yeah. Then we're going to, I think, probably see a big rally. It makes the Fed seem kind of sadistic. Yeah. And wait I mean, to see that pain. Yeah, base, base, and exactly. It's the, it's the pressure. Uh, okay. Um, well, we, so, you know, we already looked at kind of the cap rate yeah. um, and ten-year Treasury spread, which which Cushman and Wakefield also touches on. Um, but I, th- this is, I think, this is interesting um, because uh, Noah Stone from Bercadia has touched on looking not necessarily as much at you know the kind of the ten-year Treasury rates, but looking at some of the corporate bond yield as more of a proxy mm-hmm. for cap rate movements. And you know we've we've definitely seen the corporate bond yield rates um, after you know a long time decline. You know similar to cap rates, they've shot up to kind of already to you know January nineteen levels, um, which which I find interesting. Now the life insurance um, commercial lending you know rates you know they are they've been moving down and they're starting to move up as well, um, and that's kind of what we're comparing here. Um, but I think I think that's interesting, and I think that again could be the indication that. We're probably going to see some currency cap rates rise um, more than we, we've yeah. already seen today. So, 
Yeah, I, I thought that that was interesting, and, and thanks for that explanation there. Because I was I was interested in that the the connection between the corporate bonds and this in the CRE market. Yeah, there. yeah. No, I think it's a good good relatively good proxy. Yeah. Um, because again, because you know, like the ten year yield, um, it's market driven, but it's like you know risk free rate. Whereas mm-hmm. you know the corporate spreads, you know, there's a little more risk. It's relatively relatively low risk, but same with like you know multifamily apartments. Um, it's re- it's relatively very low risk, but it's not risk free like a ten year treasury yeah. is supposed to be. Okay. Um, okay. This, this Zumper National Rent Report. Um, tell us a little bit about this. They've got some. They've got three notable trends. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, I I think that it, actually this does signal out. Or <laughs> this does signal. San Francisco and Chicago as as kind of markets to watch as markets with a different trajectory and uh, and this is actually interesting too is like not a lot of reports track New York rents for whatever reason like that that Newmark report I don't think that it was in the collection really? of markets that they covered mm-hmm. and then I was looking like I said I was looking at um, Yardy Matrix reports for for a snapshot of these 2019, and they didn't have New York rents. I wonder if it's just a whole different animal um, because uh, of usually, rent control. Uh, and, of, they usually have them somewhere. Okay, um, I'll, I'll have to look at. Maybe yeah. I need to control F. Or, may, or, or sometimes <laughs> I, do, I ignore it also, just because like we don't yeah, invest yeah. in New York, so it's it's a good metric to track. But um, um, so just I just want to just touch on there. There's yeah. three kind of uh, kind of takeaways. Um, you know, their rent index hit yet another all time high in May, and rent growth in 2022 continues to outpace 21. Um, but they're asking, is that about to change with home sales? The home sales market cooling down thanks to rising interest rates, sagging month over month rent numbers could foreshadow a less frantic rental market. I mean, I, I think a lot of people again would like maybe some less uh, a less frantic market, but we like rent growth. Um, the San Francisco Bay Area, this is number two on their takeaways. Um, the San Francisco Bay Area has been home to some of the highest rents in the country for better part of the 21st century, but more than two years after COVID-19 pandemic began, it's one of the only markets where rent hasn't returned to its pre-pandemic levels. That's what we were talking about earlier. Yeah, sure, it's on the list for twelve percent rent growth, but it's because they had fifteen percent decline. Yeah. yeah, don't you love to read? So I'll come, I'll write something to report, and then and then I'll see, you know, the next report like says the same things. Like, All right, maybe yeah. I'm onto yeah. something yeah. here. So <laughs> now number three, the Midwest isn't home to the hottest rental markets, but Chicago posted a substantial year-over-year jump in May. The growth isn't consistent across Chicago metro area as some cities are experiencing enormous rent growth while others are posting declines. And again, I think that's true about the Midwest. It's not like the Sun Belt where every single market is yeah. growing. You have to know the right markets to go into, mm-hmm. um, which again, that's what creates a lot of opportunity. Markets and sub-markets, yeah, for sure. Exactly. Um, so you know, they're saying, is the rental market next? Um, app because the home sales market is cooling. And I think that's a really good question because I remember when we were um, earlier on in the pandemic, when we, st- we first started before we saw rents really picking up. Mm-hmm. We saw that we saw the home sales starting to pick up yeah. um, first, and um, and we were wondering what the correlation was. And I, I'm trying to remember if it was Greg Willett or it was one of the big housing research um, folks mm-hmm. um, who said that you know really housing demand is housing demand. If there's housing demand for for sale homes, it also translates to demand yep. for apartments because it's really driven by household formation. And so even though that, um, but the even though that buying a home is more unaffordable than it ever has been today, which in theory you would see more renters mm-hmm. um, being renters of necessity because they just can't afford to buy a home, but we have to compare that to just the demand destruction and the household formation declines of someone maybe deciding that's on the margins of like they're going to live with roommates or they're yep. going to move back in with their parents. Um, and so what's the difference between those two factors? More what, renters from... What factors will drive home buyers into the rental market versus... Well, how many people are going to really be removed from the market? How many yeah. people are just going to mm-hmm. be... I'm not looking for a home at all right now. Rents are too... Because rents are too high and yeah. homes are too high. I'm just... I can't afford any of it. I'm going to move back in with my parents mm-hmm. versus... Or compared to all these individuals that are like, I want, I want to buy a home, but I just got, you know... I was trying to get pre-approved for a mortgage and, you know, I only qualify for X now because of, you know, where prices are and where interest rates are. 
I can only I can't afford the house that I want. So I'm going to wait it out another year or two. See, I think that the latter story is the one that I've been hearing. Maybe it's the, my bias yeah. as a multi, you know multifamily professional. But uh, I haven't heard a whole lot of, you know, that was the Great Recession. The story Great Recession was roommates living yeah. with parents um, and, and all that kind of multi-generational, you know, in the same. Well, what I'm wondering it's showing up is in that the kind of the C-class market, mm. um, because we have seen we, we've. We're running into ceilings kind of in the C-class um, assets, um, kind of the lower rent assets, yeah. because you're just not seeing the wage growth. You just don't have the excess savings. Yeah, it's got you a know, lot of demand, but the rent it, growth. It's a lot of demand, but just you, know, you can't squeeze blood out of a turnip. Yeah. And, like people can only pay so much. Um, and that's where we're seeing, you know, a couple hundred basis points difference in rent growth between C class assets and kind of that B and A class space. Mm -hmm. But their occupancy is higher, but it's still, they have lower because, yeah, yeah because they just can't get it. That's yeah. interesting. Now, I don't know, there's probably going to meet some kind of balance over the next couple of years, but I think at least in the short term, you're, we're going to probably see more demand to kind of luxury, A class, you know, mm -hmm. brand new, really nice stuff. Because people, hey, they wanted to buy their first home. They've got money to spend. They just don't have that much money. They were still want a nice place. Um, but then also, you know, kind of your B class as well. People looking for nice, you know, space, but they just want a nice yeah. place to live. And they may have been looking at some of the brand new A class stuff, but now they're priced out of that. They still want a nice, clean place to live. That B class, kind of solid B, you know, checks the boxes because they don't want to necessarily live in a C class property. Yeah, I, I, I would definitely agree for sure. Um, you, you know, you you were hitting on a lot of this connection between um, the housing market and the multifamily market. Um, now, I do want to note what their rent growth uh, projections are here. Um, it's around uh, what what is. It's about 13%, 13 or 14, well, depending on I whether it's one is, bed or two yeah, bed. Um, um, they break it down by yeah. that. Um, but it's, you know, the rate of growth, like we've said, the rate of growth is slowing down a little bit, but it's still at, a, man, yeah, it's I'd love to see flip. these numbers. <laughs> any yeah, other year. it's growing, you know, four times what like normal um, yeah. growth is. So, but, but yeah, just to kind of return to, um, to, to the idea of the connection between, single family homes, um, the single family rental market and multifamily, um, the reports from Bercadia and NAR really dig into that, uh, with, with some, uh, yeah. with some detail for sure. Let's get into it. Um, this is one of the, the, these two reports that I just referenced are reports from last week that I really wanted to cover. And I, I actually really am glad that we, that we had a chance to, to cover them today. Um, single family rental market is not the multifamily market, but as a growing part of the housing market as a whole, it's worth paying attention to mm -hmm. more in investors and institutions are buying single family homes and leasing them out to renters. Additionally, there is a growing population of renters who are interested in the privacy, outdoor space and lifestyle of a single family home compared to an apartment unit. So even as as it you know it's it's relevant because it's part of the larger housing market as a whole but it's also relevant because it reflects and is responding to the preferences of i think a lot of millennials mm -hmm. that want to live in a home maybe can't afford it so this is you know this is solving that problem for them um i'm glad that you that, that you've got this uh chart here uh, it's a graph a scatter plot um where it looks at single family rent and value growth across primary secondary markets not only the growth in the rent but the growth in the um the growth in the value of a home um first they're seeing higher increases on the whole for smaller markets, when you're talking about rent increases for smaller markets than larger markets. Secondly, there seems to be about a three to one ratio um, for home value increases versus rent increases. I'm not sure what the yardstick is there, but that's but that's what the correlation that I see right here. So basically, for a place like Tem Tampa that has around a 10% increase in single family rents, the home values in the area increased by about 30%. I don't know what the uh, like I said. I don't know what the standard math is that you apply if that's typical or not typical. But that is the pretty well, that, clear that's relationship. For, that's that that's for the out, that's for the, like the, the strongest performers because for like um, or, or I, I mean is it similar? So I mean I guess at a five percent rent growth um, for like let's look at Indianapolis. So they're mm -hmm. saying kind of what 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 would you say this like seven um, yeah. seven or so percent rent growth. Um, you know that we're looking at closer to a you know what 15, 17 percent. Yeah, you know yeah, overall that's true. Um, um, so I, at I think, least double, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, at least double, but, but I think that is interesting. I think they're just identifying which markets are getting the most rent growth, but they're also appreciating, um, yeah, you know, just really kind of comparing. Yeah. And that, and that's the bottom line is that, that uh, appreciation of these, of homes is, is going up a lot faster than rents. Um, and, 
I'd like to know again what the yardstick is, but it is, but it's very clear in this in this chart. And now, what the chart is actually kind of supposed to <laughs> supposed to represent, or it looks like their, their top line um, message here is that for tertiary markets and secondary markets, the um, they're seeing a lot more a lot more single family rent growth than um, for larger markets. Now there are some high flyers, Phoenix, Atlanta, and Dallas that are seeing some great rent growth in single family homes, but there's more. Uh, there's more markets within the smaller and tertiary, the secondary and tertiary. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. Detroit has always been interesting because, you know, there's some areas that are really nice and they're growing, but then a lot of it's like you want to stay completely clear of. And yeah. so that makes very inefficient. And I think there's some opportunities if you know really know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But I mean, look at that. They're seeing good rent growth, but like the appreciation is just completely lax lackluster and is a true outlier on kind of the opposite end of like where, you know, like Phoenix and Atlanta, where they're seeing both rent growth and appreciation. Um, Detroit, they're getting the income and, and cash flow. And it'll be interesting if we see some people trying to figure Detroit out and if they yeah, can get comfortable. Well, that, yeah, yeah. I bet there are some people there's, that there's some reasons not. Have. There's some reasons not to invest in Detroit. But I think that, you know, it's going to get to a point of where, you know, the price you know, mm -hmm. could be right um, if you can kind of g g grapple with some of those uncertainties yeah. in the market itself. I also, so the, this report also measures increases in relation to mortgage rates um that's not this it, it's the chart uh, yeah underneath there now this is what I, I compared to it looks beautiful it looks like a kandinsky painting i don't understand it at all <laughs> I'm supposed to be the expert matt i know <laughs> i know I, I do think i have an artistic appreciation but maybe not an analytical understanding it's, um yeah you know, I think they're comparing you know, obviously the mortgage they're comparing the mortgage rate to uh, you know value increases between different time periods. You know, they've got so they've got post Great Financial Crisis, 1990s to 2009, and then 1985 to 1990. What they're really looking at is kind of different cycles of kind of different interest rate environments and what that did to um, valuations. And I mean, definitely there's a a very post GFC. Um, there's 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 a big correlation between you know lower interest rates and higher returns, and then um, you know not as much kind of in between. I mean, they only got interest rates up to kind of five percent, so rates didn't ever get up that high, but not necessarily a ton of demand destruction unless um, the uh, really kind of that highest price point. Um, you know, 1990 to 2009, though. Um, you know, if you're in that sweet spot, then really there wasn't much uh, destruction until. You know, again, the interest rates were completely different, um, but it was actually kind of the lower interest rates were there. There was more issues, then everything was stable at the higher interest rate period. Um, but then what's interesting is 1985 to 1990, which is kind of a short period of time compared to the other two um, periods of comparison, but it's a much more kind of linear trajectory of, you know, higher interest rates, um, you know, slight declines in um, value. That's Gross. interesting. So it's like you're introducing someone when things are so low, then it seems like a little bit more volatile. Yeah, you know, and I, I don't know. I don't know if I love this, these comparisons either because they're, they're they're kind of toying around with you know they're just there are a lot of different forces, a lot of different factors in these time periods. Not even using kind of similar time periods. I mean, they're using cycles. Yeah, um, w w which I think makes sense, but. Um, I, I don't know how much I'm pulling away from this, so maybe I'm in the same camp as you. I, I would like for someone to you know put, put this report together to walk us through, and maybe we can maybe we can get them on. Certainly, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, um, there, there's a lot of really good stuff in this report, Matt. In, anything else that you think we really should highlight? That um, not exactly. Um, I just wanted to, uh, yeah, I just wanted to point to it because it its comparison between its comparison between home values and rents was something that I think is worth, yeah. you know, is worth reemphasizing. And also, you know, the, the idea that these rent increases and, um, and single family home market, it's, it's effect in the, in the general housing market is, yeah. is worth calling attention to as well. And something that I want to, I can emphasize in the, the following report. Well, well, I would say a good transition is, um, this is an NAR report, the impact of institutional buyers on home sales, um, and single family rentals. There's been a lot of discussion kind of pop just in the media, just, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, dinner table conversations about, you know, these kind of corporate landlords, these institutional buyers that are, they're the ones that are driving up yeah. prices. And this kind of looks at that. And I, I think it maybe kind of maybe softens that argument a little bit. Um, yeah, but this, what, what do you think, Matt? I, this was maybe my favorite report 
maybe the last two weeks, even though we didn't get to it last week, it's got it's got some ni- just one figure really, um, but it's a good counterpoint, honestly, to uh, to that general narrative. Like, well, these big fat cat investors are coming in, buying our houses, increasing the price, making it so that the average Joe can't ever buy a house. Yeah, don't sell to corporations, you know. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Like so, it's gonna, how much that's going to Here's the crucial figures. Um, and and it, I'm taking this, I'm quoting this here. Um, the median purchase price among institutional buyers was typically 26% below the state median price. And then they follow that by saying, in states with higher institutional buyer share, which is above 13%, the difference was 20%. And, if, and in states with lower institutional buyer share of uh, the difference was thirty percent. Um, Interesting. So, so, so yeah. whether well, institutional buyers aren't buying the top of the market, they're buying you know, more affordable homes. Yep. Um, so the, they're not necessarily the ones that are really increasing. Maybe, so maybe they're buying up the starter homes. They're putting some pressure, which I can you know I, I can see that happening. Mm-hmm. But they're not moving the market. Yeah, they're buying under under the median price for the state. A little oh under yeah a little under a quarter. Below, it, it's and it's on. It's the the majority of buyers, which are you know end users mm-hmm. who are going to live there. They're the ones that are buying on emotion. They just need a place. Yep. They're not looking at what the return is. So they're the ones that are really moving the prices up rather than the institutions. And then really in that second saying. figure, you know, you think, okay, so what if there's a lot of competition among institutional buyers? Do they suddenly start buying homes at prices above the state average? No, no. Instead, they buy in, instead of a quarter under. Now they buy maybe a fifth mm-hmm. under uh, uh, of under the the average price. Now I think that you raise a good point though. It's it's not as simple as institutional buyers just waiting to buy any given house at twenty five percent below the price. Well, instead, they're turning it into rental. So yeah. you know it's got to make sense as a rental. They're buying that different strata of homes yeah. that's different from the average home. And and you we were talking about this before um, before the recording is that it, it, this could actually impact first time home buyers that are buying a little bit lower value homes. Um, yeah. I think that even then, it, it, the, the competition among institutional buyers really raises raises the price 6%, which 6% is still a well, lot. So, but, so, but, that, but that's the difference between markets where there's institutional activity and, and, and not, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, and yeah, we were talking about this before, it's a you know correlation and causation mm-hmm. question because... Yeah, there's a correlation that the markets that institutional investors are investing in are appreciating at 6% more. Prices are 6% higher. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're the ones that are causing that all yeah. that appreciation. Maybe they're causing some of it, but I think it makes sense that they would be choosing markets that have a higher chance of appreciation than the average market in yeah. the United States. So maybe so worst case scenario, if it's 100% Attributed to these institutions, it's six percent different. Mm-hmm. I don't, but I think it, you know, maybe it's one two percent that's kind of moving the needle because there's still yep. the percentage of transactions, you know, of institutions buying single family homes. I think it's still in the like kind of like the two to four percent. Yeah, so like I think it's, it's, it's mid low mid single digits. Five Is that in and, yeah, here? five in the max. I think I don't. I forget which which report said that, but it was around five percent. Yeah, I know it's I know it's low mid, mid low mid single digits. Yeah, so yeah. it's not enough volume to really move a market mm-hmm. and certainly not to be attributed by all the growth so um i would i would say that it is impacting people and this and why it is you know being spoken about in the media and people are talking about it is because it is affecting single uh, first time home buyers mm-hmm. all these millennials who are in peak home buying um you know periods of their life and they are getting priced out and there's just no inventory there yeah um and that's frustrating that's not necessarily moving the prices as much the people who are really moving the prices are the other first-time home buyers who are willing to pay you know twenty five fifty thousand dollars over asking price and the fact that there have historically been in the past like decade or two there have been years where there have been more institutional buyers previously than 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 currently oh, so yeah. it, so so the implication is that maybe you know the re- institutional buyers aren't trying to move the market as much as respond to the market yeah. um, and because I th- I think that you know, if they could, they would. <laughs> they would try yeah, to move the market. They just can't. It's just, yeah. it, you know, they're the the aggregate effect of millions of individual home buyers with that strong housing demand is too powerful, even for corporations to affect. Yeah. I know I may be eating my words soon, but uh, but I think that you know it is a powerful force. It, it is, and um, you know, looking where they're making allocations and yeah. what they see to having long term prospects, I think is worth paying attention to mm-hmm. um, as, as well. I think th- those are good points. Yeah. Um, all right, Matt. Well, this has been a great 
set of reports today. Again, very informative. Um, check all these out. Hop on over to greatreport.com. Um, we update it daily. Um, but great greatcapitalllc.com slash newsletter. That's where you can sign up for the weekly newsletter. I mean, it's the best multifamily newsletter if you want to stay on top of the market. You know, hands down, we keep getting consistent feedback saying this is what I, this is my essential tool for the week. I mean, a lot of syndicators tell us just, you know, privately, like I basically use your report to like use my whole like next week of like content. Like I'm going to post on LinkedIn or wherever. And I'm like, that's awesome. Yeah. That's, that's why we did it. We wanted to aggregate it all because it's not always easy to find. I'm hoping... You know, it's our you know contribution you know to the broader industry, helping hoping everyone can make some really good decisions. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, if you're at a point where you're saying, okay, I think this makes sense. I do want to invest in multifamily apartments. Maybe you already are. You're looking for a new sponsor. You know, we're only open to accredited investors, but you know, we'd love to ha- love to have a conversation with you to see if it makes sense from our stand um, point of view, from your point of view. We have alignment of interests. You know, goals are aligned. Um, it's not right for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it is, you can go to gray.fund or just go to Gray Capital. Um, you can learn more. And we've got an investment portal. I mean, you can sign up without ever talking to us if you want to and invest. We'd like to have a conversation with you, though. Um, and typically, most investors want to speak to the folks that are gonna actually going to be you know, managing those investments. Yeah. So not, not by chatbot. <laughs> yeah, not by chatbot. Although some people you know, teach their own. Um, all right. Well, again, appreciate it. Make sure you give this video a like. Leave a comment because if you leave a good comment, we're gonna we're going to bring it up on the next episode. Um, so I guess be prepared for your comment or question because we'll dig into it. We've gotten some really good comments in the past that we featured. Um, but you know, a subscription again and a like, all of that pumps us up in the algorithm. It helps get this show out to more people. Again, help the industry be a little bit more efficient, get some more information, be a little bit more empirical about it. Um, leave a comment if you see an error. Um, if there's a misspelling, oh yeah, Matt, Matt, yeah, well, maybe there we, was a misspelling, and um, I I deleted that comment, but I'm going to address it right now. It was now. a test. It was a, te- it was a test to the audience. <laughs> I uh, I misspelled something on the on a uh, text box, and I apologize for it, and it's never going to happen again. There you go, accountability. I've got to own it. Accountability. Um. All right. Well, again, we'll catch you on the next episode of the Great Report. Have a good week. <laughs>